Well, welcome to everyone in the room. I want to give a special welcome to the ambassadorial corps that has turned out today, as well as GMF partners. I'm Karen Donfried. I'm GMF's president. And I want to say that along with welcoming all of you in the room, we are live streaming this event. So I know that in the US there are particular audiences in Minnesota, Indiana, and Massachusetts that will be watching. And we know there will be a very large audience watching in Europe because there's such tremendous interest on both sides of the Atlantic in how the transatlantic trade and investment partnership will move forward. And we couldn't be more delighted than to be joined by the Congressional TTIP Caucus. And I want to give a very warm welcome to Congressman Paulson, to Congressman Young of Indiana, and to Congressman Keating of Massachusetts. And we have the proverbial empty chair, <laughs> which we think will be filled by Congressman Neal, but he got detained on the Hill. And I know the very difficult schedules that the three of you have. And so the fact that you've made time to speak with us is very much appreciated. You've received the full bios of these members of Congress in the invitation. So I just want to say one thing about each one. And I'm going to start with Congressman Paulson because he is an alumnus of GMF's Marshall Memorial Fellowship Program. And he is our first alum to serve in Congress. And we know that Congressman Paulson is always a trendsetter. And we know that's going to be true on this as well. Congressman Young served as a staff member for former Senator Luger, whom we are proud to call a senior transatlantic fellow here at GMF. So we appreciate that bond to Congressman Young. And Congressman Keating has a long-standing relationship to GMF, and in fact, one of his early trips to Europe was with us. So it's wonderful to, for all of those reasons to have them on the stage. And I know that all of us were watching the State of the Union last night, waiting for the mention on trade, and the president did not disappoint us. And in fact, he called on Congress to give him trade promotion authority and in his words said, we need it to protect American workers with strong new trade deals from Asia to Europe that aren't just free, but also are fair. And GMF has been working on TTIP because of course it's so important to strengthening transatlantic cooperation. And we've worked on it in terms of publications and research and events. But I know that you're not interested in hearing our views, you're interested in hearing their views. So with no further ado, I want to pass the mic over to our wonderful moderator, Bruce Stokes, who is the Director of Global Economic Attitudes at the Pew Research Center and also a non-resident fellow here at GMF. So with that, Bruce, over to you. And thank you, Felice, so much. Thank you, Karen. And, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And, and uh, I think the size of this audience and, and the quality of this audience suggests yeah, that the interest in this topic in the transatlantic community here in Washington. Um, I do think we should remind ourselves that this is po possibly the single most important transatlantic initiative since NATO expansion a decade ago. And it is arguably the single most important transatlantic economic initiative since the Marshall Plan. So I think it's very fitting that we're here at the Marshall Fund uh, having a discussion about this. Um, uh, I'd like to thank our, our, our participants. Uh, it's great to have a bipartisan discussion about this issue. I think uh, truly this is one of the bipartisan issues that Congress and the White House can work together on. Um, and uh, certainly uh, our polling data shows that there is a broad support for a tree, free trade agreement between uh, uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, the poll we did in April of last year showed that 53% of Americans thought that a free trade agreement between the US and Europe was a good idea. Um, a Eurobarometer poll that came out in November of this year of European nations found that 58% of Europeans across Europe uh, thought uh, this was a good idea. Um, however, these numbers do belie some of the political issues that we want to talk about today, and I think there are we know uh, our political issues around trade in the United States. Uh, only 39% of Germans think this is a good idea, and that's a big problem for in Europe. Uh, more close to home here, only 20% of Americans think that trade 
uh, creates jobs, and only 17% of Americans think trade increases wages. Uh, and since one of the arguments that uh, the administration makes, the business community makes, is this is gonna be good for you, that argument's not working very well. Now, this is trade in general, it's not TTIP in particular, but I do think that there, it suggests why this is not a slam dunk politically uh, it, it by any stretch of the uh, imagination. Uh, now, with those uh, issues in mind, uh, I'm going to ask the, the, the congressman a, a couple of questions, then we'll open it up to, to uh, questions from the audience. Um, I would like to ask actually all three of you just for a brief, a brief answer. Um, you're, tr you're obviously committed to TTIP. Uh, you're co-chairman of the TTIP caucus. Um, but TTIP is a long way from being an issue that Congress has to deal with. And it, uh, I think it's, it's self-evident that the Trans-Pacific Partnership will come to a vote, even if, if it does ever come to a vote, it will come to a vote before TTIP does. Um, when you talk to your colleagues in the cloakroom, if you don't bring TTIP up, do they ever bring it up? Uh, or is it really still a small group of members who actually are thinking about this today? Uh, anybody have a thought on that? Well, I'll go first. First of all, yeah. let me just thank the German Marshall Fund for hosting us as, uh, in our, for allowing us to uh, communicate also with our European friends that are interested in this issue. And I think you raise a very important issue. Now, some of us have known, I think, that a trade agreement with Europe is the right thing to do. We've been advocating it for a long time. Congressman Neal and I sent a letter with some of our colleagues on a bipartisan level urging the president to make this a priority, which he has done now for the last several years. And the only reason that the Trans-Pacific Partnership discussions are, are moving forward closer to a vote is because those negotiations are just farther along. And we just wanna make sure Europe, because these are, it's a huge opportunity with you know, so much global trade and economic development already and uh, GDP already between our two continents, we don't want that to let, get left behind. And there is conversation in the cloakroom and among our colleagues because I think Europe is a very unique situation or opportunity where we have common allies and friends and relationships and values already. And I'll let them speak to that because I think we've all shared that feeling. But it's also an education level where members of Congress that get elected, just as European members get elected mm -hmm. to the parliament, want to make sure that they're looking at all the details and doing what's right for their constituency. And we're doing the exact same thing. Any thoughts on, on whether it comes up? Well, I do. I think there's, uh, in conversations with colleagues, uh, I agree with Eric, there's, uh, there, there's conversations. It's usually the people that are surrounding the committees uh, of interest. Uh, but I think that's a good thing because in Congress, if there's a lot of conversations about something, it's usually because there's a negative perception of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're the uh, uh, body that decides what not to do sometimes. And, and I think that's a positive. Uh, and I do uh, want to thank the German Marshall Fund uh, and Karen uh, for her work and Leah for her, Maya for her work. And, but getting into the issue that uh, you talked about too with the support generally through polls, uh, I think that uh, from my own perspective, uh, I'm a skeptic uh, of uh, free trade agreements and trade agreements because uh, I feel like uh, so many of my colleagues that the U.S. has been burnt by some of those in terms of labor. The president mentioned that uh, last night as well. And this is just so different. And our job is to uh, work hard, and I know this is gonna be uh, transmitted to Europe where there are skeptics right now to this trade agreement, but I'm an enthusiastic supporter of this agreement because uh, of the shared values and so many other issues which I think we'll get into in this discussion. Uh, so it is important to be talking, not only to colleagues, but also talking uh, across the Atlantic uh, to people who have the same degree of concern to really allay some of those concerns and to say, you know what, uh, we're gonna be able to do this together because this is unique. Well, let me join the others in thanking the German Marshall Fund. Uh, really appreciate you convening this forum. I appreciate all of you uh, being engaged on this issue. Um, you know, I, I've sensed uh, a, maybe a small uptick in uh, the chatter about trade generally and about TTIP more specifically. Um, yes, uh, among members of the committee, but also more broadly uh, within the Republican conference and, and maybe occasionally uh, with a colleague or two uh, across the aisle. Uh, I would attribute that to a couple of different dynamics. One, the security environment has changed. So this is not just as I see it, 
uh, an economic relationship that we're trying to strengthen transatlantically, but uh, this ought to be regarded and sold, frankly, as a way to uh, secure uh, our respective countries and regions uh, and our, our peoples and our way of life, especially as the United States increasingly focuses on the Pacific theater. I, I think uh, ensuring that we have allies that can help us take care of uh, the Middle East and North Africa uh, and uh, any threats that uh, might pop up uh, in Eastern Europe and beyond from Russia and so forth. So um, the other reason is just uh, the increasing chatter in this town about possible uh, grand deals that might be struck. And uh, I'm hearing that tax reform is one possibility. Uh, Cybersecurity doesn't excite the imagination of, of a whole lot of people, but the first on the list usually is trade. This is, this is really our big opportunity, this Congress, I think, to work together with the administration and uh, at least build some goodwill, maybe build some trust generally on the issue of trade. And then once TTIP is ready, uh, hopefully that will be uh, ready for passage. Let me ask you a follow up on that. Sure. As part of a grand deal on trade, the first element would be fast track trade That's negotiating right. authority or what is also called trade promotion authority. The president actually mentioned that uh, in, in his speech last night, said, I want this. Um, now, for those of you who don't follow trade issues, this is a, the, the Congress giving up their constitutional right to amend a piece of legislation. And uh, the Congress has done this since 1972. It's not new. But it is not easy, necessarily, to get it from Congress. George Bush got it from, the Cong from a Republican-controlled Congress by two votes in what the Washington Post at the time called the second dirtiest vote buying they'd ever seen. Yeah. So this is difficult. This can be difficult. That said and done, what are your sense of your colleagues' willingness to grant the president uh, for, uh, trade negotiating authority, and what kind of bells and whistles do you think people will want to put on that authority uh, to maintain Congress's role in this process? Well, let me let me just yeah. first speak uh, to the way you styled the question, yeah. and I, I would respectfully say uh, this is not extra constitutional. This Nobody is not is. forswearing any of our constitutional prerogatives. Instead. Uh, this is merely asserting the constitutional prerogatives we have to help shape the negotiating objectives on the front end of the process mm -hmm. as opposed to the back end of the process. It's a pragmatic approach that allows counterparties to negotiate uh, when you're dealing with a, a, a number of seats at, at the table and a number of different interests. And, and so I think it's very important that the American people, through their elected representatives, have the opportunity to uh, help shape those negotiating objectives so that later on, when that agreement, uh, full of final offers, which would otherwise be much weaker without this authority, uh, later on Congress can uh, give an up or down vote uh, on that agreement. With respect to the specific issues, uh, I think uh, many in this audience are aware currency manipulation, when we're talking about the Pacific Agreement, uh, has been of particular import. Uh, but uh, the ones that I hear come up time and again with respect to the ES, US-EU relationship are the investor-state dispute uh, mm -hmm. mechanism, uh, genetically modified uh, organisms, which uh, I think uh, some balance needs to be taken in, into account there with respect to the amount of productivity uh, that s some of these uh, GMOs can uh, result in and help feeding uh, the rest of the world, certainly important to a state like Indiana and our own economy, I admit. But uh, So those, those are a couple I, I'm sure others can embellish on my answer. Well, let's think, yeah, go, go ahead. Too, that, yeah. uh, it's not just what's in the agreement. I think that people spend more time uh, and the debate moves forward on this issue. I think you're going to see a real concern on what happens if we don't do this because there will be a vacuum. And that vacuum is going to be filled by the emerging countries who don't share those same values in terms of labor, in terms of the environment, in terms of guarding intellectual property, and, and in terms of what Todd mentioned, in terms of what is unique about this, we have, if we're successful, even reasonably successful, we'll have over one half of the world's GDP between the European Union and the US. And in terms of what we're seeing in Ukraine and seeing other ways, the real strength 
in, in terms of keeping pace and moving our values forward, our collective values forward, uh, rests on economic strength. You, you've mentioned these values issues twice, and I thought what was striking in the President's State of the Union last night is that he highlighted that, and he called out China in particular, saying they don't share our values, and we want our values to shape the rules of trade going forward. Now, a GMF survey in 2007, I believe, and a Pew survey last year actually ask people why they would support such an agreement. And the single most prominent reason people gave was it will help us in competing with China. So the public gets it, that China's the issue. I must admit, in my own conversations with people at the State Department or USTR, there, the, I, mentioning the C word is anathema. <laughs> the president didn't shy away from it last night. And so I'm curious, how powerful do you think as politicians this values question may be as the public debate heats up? Well, I, I should just mention, I, I think a lot of us and the public in general realizes that with this agreement and these negotiations going forward that this is our opportunity to streamline regulations, uh, facilitate trade, the, the movement of goods and services, uh, and, and more than anything else, if we can set those high standards and have a high standard agreement, then all the other bad actors around the world, right, are forced to follow these higher standards. And that's where we can lead forward. And so China and some others that have been, you know, throwing their weight around and are growing economically um, and maybe don't play by the same rules on some issues, intellectual property mm -hmm. and yeah. others, we need to make sure that we are leading here. And that's where our common interests are with Europe. And I'll just mention Trade Promotion Authority. Our leadership in both the House and the Senate, I think, is going to move it forward. The President mentioned the State of the Union last night. And it will be a priority. So our European friends need to know that that is going to continue the momentum for this to yeah. move forward. I guess Go very ahead. quickly, um, we often speak uh, in, when it comes to uh, the world of trade uh, about regulations, uh, uh, about standards, uh, about dispute resolution mechanisms. Ultimately, those are just manifestations of our view of the world, of our values, right? You know, the, the way we sh shape worker rights, uh, the way an economy operates, uh, the way we resolve disputes. So um, this, in the end, is about economic liberty. It's about freedom. And to the extent, as Eric said, those regulations uh, can be of our making collectively uh, with the European community. I think that's uh, to the and advantage I, of all of us. Yeah, exactly. And look at our starting point right now. I mean, with the European Union and the U.S., we're already each other's great trading partners. It's not, this is nothing new. But together, the influence on the rest of the world is something that's extraordinary. I mean, we share a, a belief in the rule of law, of transparency, of uh, due process, which notably some others don't share. Right. And it does seem to me that's part of what the president seemed to be getting at. Now, I'm curious on the question of transparency, for example. This is a, this is a huge issue among the critics of the trade process in general. There's not enough transparency. Now, I would point out to you that as members of Congress, you have a right to see ev everything. Uh, you have a, I dare say, USTR will come running to your door if you ever ask for a briefing. At least they claim that, and I think the numbers tend to bear that out. So what more transparency could possibly be available? And isn't there a danger if there's too much transparency we give away our own bargaining positions and our own bottom line in a way that really disadvantages the United States. Well, I think that there's a concern on both sides of the Atlantic about too early in the process drawing red lines. Uh, one of the things we've been able to do with a fresh start is keep a comprehensive view of this. Uh, those other distinctions can happen during the process, uh, but we don't want to limit the ability uh, to make this successful. And I think that uh, transparency is critical critical to me as a person who has some uh, past misgivings about other trade agreements. Uh, but this time, I think, because of the entities that are involved, it's going to be more trans. We will set a standard higher in this process, I believe, with the European Union and the U.S. of transparency than there has been in any other trade agreement. Yeah. I'll just take this opportunity yeah. Yeah. to commend USTR uh, in making available different documents uh, in um, being transparent. Uh, but I also think that uh, USDR is it's a very small entity and they accomplish a whole lot, uh, at least history uh, indicates, uh, with that fairly uh, small staff. And uh, to the extent that the president uh, 
uh, uses every means at his disposal mm -hmm. to let other colleagues know that uh, these things are available, that would be most helpful. And to the extent the president continues to push for trade promotion authority in a very vigorous way, uh, unlike what he's done in the past, I don't say this to sound critical, mm -hmm. but I just think it's imperative that uh, the president continue to push for TPA, uh, then I think uh, we can succeed on, on some of these trade fronts. Now, one of the issues the Europeans are pushing on yeah. is um, to include an energy mm -hmm. chapter in, in TTIP. Um, now, we're awash in oil and natural gas, um, uh, but we seem to be resisting uh, putting energy into the agreement. Um, uh, at a time when we really would like to help the Europeans reduce their dependence on Russia for geostrategic mm -hmm. reasons. Um, on the other hand, y your members, you have to go back and talk to your constituents. And if we export more of this oil and gas, if I were a constituent, I might say, well, does that mean my home heating oil prices are gonna go up? Because if they do, I don't like this idea. So what, how do, how do you, what do you, what's your vision of how we should treat energy in this? Because the U.S. has basically said it's not in there. And, and what's, what do you hear from you and your colleagues abroad? Well, I think you'll see some discussion on energy being included in this. There's a, uh, a huge impetus from, uh, I think, the business side uh, of the U.S. Uh, to go ahead in that direction. Uh, there are certain things that will be done, having the ports accessible for natural uh, gas. Some of those things are still in the process of being done. But here's a, something that uh, I view from maybe a different view than most people. I think as a huge proponent of renewable energy uh, in the long term for our country, Europe is way ahead of us in those initiatives. And I think we can prosper as well uh, dealing with that back here. So I think there's a mutual mm -hmm. uh, benefit mm -hmm. in this. And one of the things that uh, I think that isn't discussed enough is the fact that we can benefit by Europe's progress in renewable energy. You know, we typically don't have an energy chapter in trade agreements right. because it's traded like other commodities, you know, as yeah. it, it just is traded. And it's certainly an area that's ripe for collaboration, given, as you mentioned, um, the larger strategic issues in, with the Ukraine and Russia and making sure that energy is going to be supplied uh, to Europe, for instance. And look, I mean, I think many in the United States are having this conversation now about more energy exports, and Europe needs to go through that conversation about recognizing the advancements in technology and what exists out there to access more energy resources, whether it's renewables or other fossil fuels in different ways. And that's what we're experiencing in the United States right now, and Europe is gonna go through that, that discussion too. Well, let me ask you another question about a, a disputed element of TTIP, and that is the investor state dispute resolution mechanism, which for those of you who don't follow this closely, there is in almost every free trade and investment agreement written over the last 20 or 30 years, a clause that says that if you are a foreign investor under this agreement and you feel that your rights, your investor rights under that agreement have been infringed, you can appeal to a special panel to resolve this dispute. Uh, there have been horrendous examples, I would say horrendous, I'll, I'll editorialize here, um, uh, uh, of companies trying to abuse that, that right. On the other hand, what's not acknowledged by the critics is that almost every one of those things failed. Uh, but it's become a huge issue in Europe. Uh, the Germans invented this, by the way, and they're yeah. probably the most upset about it now. Um, um, the, uh, and it does seem to be there's an issue here where the American business community says, we want our rights protected when we invest in other countries. And, uh, the critics say, you have a judicial system, you can go through to, to protect your rights, you don't need these kind of special tribunals. How do you think that's gonna play out in Congress? Um, given the fact that there's one in NAFTA, we put it in NAFTA, because we, frankly, we didn't trust the Mexican court system. Uh, so what, what, do you, how is it, what do you hear from your colleagues on this issue, let alone your constituents? I don't hear as much from colleagues, but what yeah. I'm hearing from uh, Europe is concerned over that matter, as you mentioned. And, and again, the one thing I'd point out is the shared values that we have. Now, I know I keep coming back to this, but it's so important. This is a different starting point. Uh, both the uh, European countries and the U.S. have strong, very strong feelings on rule of law issues, and on transparency. So we're starting off mm -hmm. at a higher level. And, and I think as the discussions proceed on this, 
that some of those things will be, some of those concerns will be alleviated uh, as the transparency becomes more clear uh, and, and our shared uh, rule of law. You know, I think that's something that, again, is a better starting point uh, for this. And I, I do think that those concerns are, are if, look at what happens in Russia in the absence of not having those mechanisms uh, for investors. And if you don't have some kind of sense that there's going to be a strong rule of law, that's going to inhibit investments from outside the EU and the US uh, you know, for our respective countries, too. So this will end up being a strong point for us, I, I believe. But it's good to question these things. Uh, yeah. It's good to air them out. Yeah. Tom? We should entertain any proposed improvements to uh, previous dispute resolution mechanisms. And, and uh, I, I'll take a very serious look at this issue. I'm still learning, and I know the process is still playing out. It has not been something that constituents have approached me about or, or other colleagues. Yeah. That's interesting. Right? I mean, it's definitely an issue more yeah. in Europe, obviously, yeah. and in the irony in Germany where it's come up uh, uh, more prevalent just given the fact that the Germans have you know, invented it, proposed it, have included it in all their other different right. trade agreements. And I don't think anyone in Europe needs to worry about the United States um, making sure that any country is going to have their regulatory ability diminished. We're certainly not going in a different direction. Our trend has yeah. been, you know, we're regulating our economies in different ways, <coughs> and we just want to make sure our investors are going to have protections, and uh, that'll yeah, what, help trade. What's interesting about the German reaction to this is our survey shows that the Germans are the least supportive of foreign investment in general uh, of all Europeans, which suggests that what, what this reaction may be is not to this mechanism, but they don't like foreign investors, <laughs> which is a bigger issue, obviously, politically. Um, uh, we want to open this up to questions and comments from the audience. Um, uh, if you have a comment, make it in the form of a question. <laughs> but <laughs> try to keep it brief uh, so we can get as many questions in as, and I'll take two or three and then we'll parcel out. You don't have to answer every one, you know, every one, but in the back here, yeah, right here. Yeah. Um, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent, Europolitics. If you're the pro-TTIP caucus, who is the anti-TTIP caucus who might be in Congress? Okay, right here. Yeah. Up here. And, it, yeah, and, and, and be sure to introduce yourself, please. Peter Wittig, German ambassador. I think we do like uh, foreign investment, especially <laughs> uh, <laughs> American. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my question may be to Congressman Keating. Uh, the, the president yesterday requested TPA from Congress, uh, and we, we, uh, we applaud him for that. The applause uh, on the floor, especially on the Democratic side, was a little tepid. Uh, and, and, and I sense there's uh, work to do for the president to convince his own party to give him a strong uh, TPA. Um, there's skepticism in my country uh, from the NGO side, but also from the unions. And this is my question. Uh, is it possible to convince uh, the unions to buy into TTIP. I know they uh, have fears that they this will be a race to the bottom, maybe more with TPP than with TTIP, uh, but it's a, an important factor for your party, for American society. Business is friendly, but the unions are very skeptical. Do you think you can convince them? I think we can answer uh, yeah, yeah, there's those two, yeah, two yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the anti-T? The anti-TTIP, uh, I think, caucus would be people who had a history like myself that just any free trade agreement uh, is something that they're not going to uh, entertain. Uh, and that's where our work comes mm -hmm. in. Uh, because, and there's also some people that have supported trade agreements in the past who are still around uh, that feel burnt by that uh, because of NAFTA and other areas. And the President even acknowledged that and acknowledges he has work to do to differentiate this from those other uh, areas. And, and why we have to uh, uh, work on this in terms of uh, and getting people. I think uh, labor uh, has to differentiate. I think the other obstacle we have is, unfortunately, the two agreements are occurring at the same time. And I know people that will not uh, support TPP who will support TTIP. Uh, and differentiating that is so important. Uh, and from mm -hmm. the labor, which is one of those constituency groups uh, on both sides uh, of the ocean that we have to work uh, to convince, those people, uh, you know, will support some of them, uh, TTIP, where they wouldn't support TPP. And that differentiation is a, and, and separating that out <coughs> is so important in terms of our success 
and convincing other members. Yeah. Any thoughts? Well, I, I'll, I'll just mention, I mean, our folks and our friends, friends in Europe should realize this is a bipartisan issue. I mean, yeah. again, you got the administration working with members of Congress, yeah. both sides of the aisle, moving a trade agenda forward, as particular around TTIP, and you can see that actively happening. And I think the skepticism that exists within the Democrat Party is, you know, traditional constituencies, labor and others are somewhat skeptical, and that makes it a little bit more challenging. Uh, but the president's been pretty firm, now mentioning this sev in several of his State of the Union speeches, that this is the right thing to do. And look, I think there's no anti-TTIP caucus other than it's an education opportunity. And what we're doing right now, it's members of the <coughs> co-chairs of the caucus, we're sending out a weekly just notice to all members of, of Congress, mm -hmm. giving them a fact of the week. You know, what does TTIP mean? It means X number of new jobs in your district, X number of growing the economy this much, uh, both in Europe and the United States. And so it's kind of a myth-busting, you know, opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's an education level, and it's, that's moving forward. Yeah, exactly. um, and again, if I could, just yeah. one other point yeah. is, is the fact that let's not fool ourselves. If we, uh, we're not in control of the entire global economy here. Uh, and if we don't act, these issues are gonna go along and be dealt with anyways. You're just negotiating with China. I mean, these issues will be resolved one way or the other, regardless of what Congress does or regardless what uh, occurs in the European Union. So our opportunity is to act on these things and to raise those standards. In fact, the very people that have concerns should embrace this because this is the opportunity where you do have some control on this because otherwise those decisions are gonna be uh, resolved in the global marketplace and we may not like those resolutions. And I, and I do think one of the issues I know that the British Foreign Minister raised in a speech here uh, late last year was the issue that the window of opportunity for doing this may close at yeah. some point. That in many things that deal with diplomacy and trade diplomacy in particular, if you can't fix it today, you kick it down the road, it might get easier tomorrow. The circumstances are gonna change yeah. in 10 years. And it's not at all clear, as you say, that we will have the leverage yeah. to shape these things the way uh, we may have the leverage, we may not have the leverage now, but we certainly are not likely to have more leverage uh, 10 years from now. Yeah, right here. Thank you, uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. Um, <coughs> on TTIP, it's very early in the process, especially the congressional process, uh, but isn't a real measure of a good agreement in TTIP gonna be a how far uh, the European Union moves on agriculture? Um, could there be uh, could Congress pass a uh, TTIP uh, if, uh, if the European Union sticks to uh, its red lines on the issues of GMO and uh, GIs and uh, hormones? Uh, right here. Peter Gandalovic, Czech Ambassador. Um, very much the same thing. Uh, obviously, TTIP is uh, uh, much more about uh, standards and certificates, uh, much less about uh, uh, tariffs, which uh, makes it less uh, understandable for the general public because obviously everybody can imagine a tariff on a goods rather than uh, standards. And standards might be of two kinds. One is uh, a disguised uh, uh, trade barrier and the other is a cultural thing like GMOs and uh, hygienic uh, standards and things that have been uh, mm, very uh, mm, hardly uh, mm, laboriously discussed in Europe and achieved in some form of regulation and then nobody would want to give them up. And the same thing is something that uh, in America it's uh, understood as uh, whatever like a matter of uh, um, um, industrial or uh, trade freedom like GMOs and uh, efficiency or whatever. So how can we bridge these uh, more or less cultural differences that uh, uh, may uh, jeopardize uh, uh, the whole thing and uh, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations have been forming uh, all across Europe, not in Germany only, it's uh, all over Europe. How do we bridge these uh, differences? Uh, Agriculture is a perennial issue in U.S.-European relations. I might remind the audience that we've been fighting with the Europeans about chickens since the 1960s when they wouldn't buy our frozen chickens. Now they won't buy our chlorine-treated chickens. But um, uh, clearly, it's a huge issue in American politics because of the 
disproportionate influence of agricultural interests because we have a Senate where people represent land, not people. So you, by definition, uh, agriculture plays a bigger role. Uh, but it's always been an issue in American uh, politics. How do we finesse these agricultural issues, especially when they're really now rooted in cultural, maybe, maybe in cultural differences, maybe some of it's protectionist, but some of it's just cultural. How do, any thoughts on that? Well, I think the perspective you gave going back to the 60s is a yeah. good way to view this because uh, we should really be clear with people. We're not going to change, this agreement is not going to change people's culture. As, as powerful as it might be uh, economically and how it can benefit uh, everyone involved, it's not going to be that uh, much of a change uh, to change cultures. <coughs> Uh, and I know in our own country, I mean, in my own, as a, uh, in my own family, we decide what foods to buy, what foods not to buy. Uh, and I think those are the situations, that individual choice that people have will be preserved regardless how these things are uh, resolved. Well, everything should be on the table. And I think one of the, we're so early in this negotiation yeah. stage, we should aim high. We should really aim high for a comprehensive agreement. If we're really gonna move the needle and lead with a high standard agreement, that other countries will follow. I mean, we shouldn't leave anything off the table. And sure, there are different challenges. There always have been challenges. We've had challenges in Asia with cultural issues with Japan, for instance, and that's been a challenge. But I think if the Europeans know that our best offers are gonna be on the table after Trade Promotion Authority mm -hmm. passes, um, they'll be willing to put their best offers on the table, and that's how we'll get a, a really good agreement. You know, one of the issues that uh, we're dealing with is the question of sound science, because that gets into the GMO issue and, and other things. I vividly remember during the negotiation of the Uruguay round talking to Jules Katz, who was the senior U.S. negotiator at the time, grand old man of U.S. trade negotiating. And I said to Jules, you've put in the agreement that these prohibitions can only be based on sound science but there is no such thing as sound science. <laughs> sound sci science is an evolving concept. And he looked at me like the trade negotiator he was and said, and that'll be somebody else's problem to deal with. <laughs> 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 well, that rooster has come home to roost here, so we're yeah. gonna have to deal with it now. Um, right back here, yeah, yeah, back here. Good morning, Elena Poptodorova, the ambassador of Bulgaria, and I would like to tell my German colleagues and our dear congressman that Bulgaria also likes foreign investment <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, less lucky than Germany, of course, but hopefully TTIP will uh, uh, help us bring more foreign investment in the country. Um, I just want to make a brief remark and then have a, something like a question and a comment uh, uh, in a mix. Um, of course, we're talking trade today and uh, TTIP is all about trade uh, in literal terms. But uh, dear congressman and uh, audience, I can hardly uh, overestimate, coming from my corner of Europe, the geopolitical importance of this uh, agreement. And please be always aware of how many more positive consequences, uh, broader consequences, the signing uh, of the agreement will bring about for both Europe and the US. Having said this, um, I, I would like to mention briefly what um, our worries are back in Europe uh, regarding resistance and right away negativism, both nationally and also on the European scene. Nationally, we have the radical uh, nationalistic parties, of course, in my country for sure, trying to, to make everything possible to, to sabotage the negotiations for obvious geopolitical reasons again. We've not even gotten to trade, which is the most uh, alarming uh, part of all. In Europe, we have a similar situation. It suffice to look at um, uh, the debates going on in the European Parliament. And here my question and uh, recommendation. I'm only too well aware of how different animals the US Congress and the European Parliament are. And I know that it takes kind of a special preparation to engage uh, 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 between the, the two of you, if I may say so. Um, are you thinking of a more direct, more regular engagement with your colleagues out in Brussels in order to make sure that you've helped the supporters um, of TTIP, uh, who happen to be uh, the common sense uh, polit politicians of Europe, uh, and to somehow uh, undermine uh, both the radical right and left. Thank you. That's actually two questions, so maybe yeah. we get, get, one is a question of why is it, it seems to me, in the wake of what's happened in Ukraine, that 
the geopolitical argument for TTIP hasn't been advanced. Mm -hmm. In other words, you don't hear it from the administration. You don't hear from members of Congress who say, look, now's the time, really, we have to send the right message to Russia. Uh, and similarly, I think the ambassador's right, the relationship between the European Parliament and Congress, there is a formal relationship. It works or it doesn't work, but it's not that engaged. But this is an issue around which it's gonna have to be engaged because both have to vote on this eventually. Well, I, I think we need to communicate more about uh, the geopolitical, geostrategic uh, sorts of benefits uh, to trade. Now, let's be under no illusions, uh, you know, enhancing connections between our civil societies and increasing the amount of trade between different regions will not solve all international crises. Uh, if everyone remembers uh, from our history books, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, right, uh, that outlawed war. War has officially been illegal in this country and, and for many other countries, I think, for 90 plus years. Um, so trade is not enough, but trade can certainly cement those relationships and align incentives between different countries. And, and I just am not hearing enough of this sort of dialogue. This, frankly, is one of the reasons I'm most interested in international trade and this relationship specifically between the U.S. and EU. Uh, the world is, is more dangerous than it was perceived to be uh, a decade plus ago. Um, I think the reason, uh, one reason why we might not be hearing a lot of this sort of communication, uh, A, people respond to uh, pocketbook issues, so that's part of it, uh, but also uh, this implicitly uh, undermines any narrative that the world is safe and secure and uh, that uh, you know, we're, we're moving into a, an era of prosperity uh, that is not threatened by these sorts of forces. We mustn't delude ourselves, though. And so uh, I'll be one of, of many uh, people speaking about this dimension of, of yeah. trade. Let me chair, uh, share an anecdote that uh, always comes to my mind. Uh, when the U.S. Senate was uh, looking at the approval of the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, he was asked, General, give us the one primary security concern you have for your country. And I think the same thing could be said for all the countries in, in the European Union. His answer was, our economy is the most important security concern. And when he said that, I said, he is right on target. Uh, because that's where the strength is. And it's, and it's, even though we're talking collectively of all the countries in the European Union, each country will benefit from this. Uh, you know, in terms of the incubators for radicalism. You know, poor economic conditions uh, are one of those incubators. Uh, and also having the strength individually, even though it's a collective group. When we get to the finish line of this, and that's our goal, I think the last 10 yards of this, which is usually the hardest 10 yards uh, in, in trying to uh, finalize an agreement, will be a little easier. I think our harder point is getting to that yeah. standpoint here, because people will see their Countries will see their own self-interest more clearly at that point. This is about yeah. creating a healthier economy for right. each of our countries that are involved in these negotiations in Europe and in the United States. And we've been doing a lot more now doing dialogue with European members of parliament. They've come over to visit more recently. We're actively engaged. I visited with then Chairman Camp and Brady. We went to Brussels in October. And the Transatlantic Dialogue Group, I know, is planning a trip uh, in the upcoming future. And so we need more of those exchanges so we can hear concerns on both sides. There was a proposal, you know, at one point by some members that, we should, that you should testify before their committees and they should testify before our committees as a way to bring that, di for formalize that dialogue in a way. But uh, that seems to have never gone anywhere. I'm Sounds very boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then we see drinking before and afterwards that would allow you to do the thing. Yeah. Right, here. right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Johan Verbecke, uh, Ambassador of Belgium. Uh, a very short question. In some quarters, there is a concern that given the fact that next year, 16, we are in an electoral year, that time is short, mm -hmm. that TPP will be rounded off before TTP. IP, and that perhaps both the Congress will have to show that it can work constructively on an issue, and TPP would be a kind of demonstration that that is the case, that the President needs an element of legacy, TPP would be the case, and TTIP, which, as you rightly said, is a much more complicated negotiation because it's a higher level complication, 
may simply fall off the road on the sides, either because we leave it, or else we take, we take pleasure with a kind of whole baked treaty. What is your feeling as regards that? One more question here, with, um, right back there. Yes, the woman there. Hi, my name is Federica Bindi. I'm a size John Hopkins. Yesterday, when President Obama was mentioning TTIP, my first reaction was like, yay. Then the narrative he used was a very, of course, he was talking to an American public, and it was a very protective one, you, you, the one you mentioned as well. So my second reaction was like, ooh, ooh, this is going to be trouble in Europe, because you know that there are lots of people opposing TTIP in Europe with no scientific basis in my mind, but they still do it. So the qu my question will be, you know, they, there is negotiation, which is one thing, but the other thing is narrative and selling to two kind of, of public which each sees their own protection as the main thing. How are we gonna reconcile this and, uh, and, and deal with it? Because it could eventually lead to the failure of, uh, of ratification. One, one more, why don't we, the woman right behind there, and then we'll ask we'll go there. Hello, thank you. Um, Melinda St. Louis, Public Citizen. My question was about the transparency um, that had been raised. You mentioned um, that, well, the European Commission recently uh, published textual proposals of, of their, their proposals to the TTIP, and so I was wondering if you all thought that USTR should follow suit in a similar way to at least publish the US textual proposals as part of the conversation to create the highest standard transparency, as you were mentioning, Mr. Keating. You want to take? Well, let in? me yeah. just start by saying I do not believe TTIP will fall off the road in any way whatsoever. Uh, the Trans-Pacific discussions just happen to be farther along, and if anything, I think that's going to build more momentum to actually engage with a European agreement. Because uh, as Congressman Keating said, I mean, there's some on his side of the aisle that are even more skeptical of the Pacific Agreement. Um, but I think once TPA moves, and it will move fairly soon, it's going to just be a momentum. Um, so it, it, you know, the United States is kind of back on the playing field with trade. We did that with Korea, Panama, South Korea. Europe's been engaging in more trade agreements. And so I think the momentum is going to continue. There should be no fears that TTIP will be pushed aside. It obviously depends what's in TTIP and when it gets done. But the current thinking in, out of Europe is it's not going to get done until the end of December of this year at the earliest. Mm -hmm. Do you? folks think that Congress would actually vote on TTIP in a presidential election year in 2016? I see no reason to preclude that from happening okay. by, by any means. Yeah. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, the president, as he's leaving office, is already advocating for this. He has no reason whatsoever to hold back, right? He's going to want to make sure that some of his issues that he's advocated for are indeed passed under his legacy. Gotcha. The global security issues? will make it easier okay. for us to talk to our constituents. Uh -huh. uh, they'll understand that part of the security interest. Uh, but also, those of us that are leaders uh, in Europe and in the United States, we really have to be responsible enough to tell our constituents that number one, this is something that'll have consequences, uh, negative consequences, if we don't act. And I think if it's so much easier politically to be against something, mm -hmm. you can be vote no on things, and then if they succeed, uh, you'll, people will forget it. Uh, so it's easier to vote no, it's a safer course. What we have to do, and that's what uh, I really want to thank the German market fund for mm -hmm. raising the level of information uh, on this. We have to make people aware that there's a decision to be made. We make it, or the emerging markets and those influences make it, and that's the choice mm -hmm. we get. If we go to our constituents and say, here's what the choice is, will be better served and there'll be much better support. What about the specific question about releasing textual, I mean, the actual text of our proposals uh, in a transparent way to the public? Do you, do you support that or oppose that? This is a, a matter of first impression, certainly uh, compelling. I'll give it some more thought. Uh, generally, I, I err on the side of transparency. Having been an attorney that's negotiated various agreements, though, I do understand the sensitivity of negotiations like this. and, and uh, yeah. So first and foremost, I think what we need to do is, is uh, make sure that we don't uh, establish processes or procedures that would sink the entire negotiations. Uh, members of Congress can continue to consult with their constituents and, and diligent members of Congress, I think, will review the text and, and uh, the draft agreements as, as they become available. But I'll give greater consideration to, 
for your uh, and proposal. It's yeah. And it's also uh, one of the reasons why we have a TTIP caucus. Yeah. Uh, because we're privy to that information and we can speak as a caucus and it provides a separate entity to yeah. do this. So that's one of the benefits. And I just to make it clear, good. members of Congress have access to this. The USTR will come up. I've reviewed yeah. documents. It's available for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll do like two more questions because we are going to have a couple more minutes right here. Uh, Chris Bledowski, Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. In addition to energy and investor protection, there's a third area where Europeans are particularly sensitive about, and that is access by European contractors and firms to the U.S. market of government contracts, both federal and in-state. How does that look from your perspective? Is there a level playing field? Can, can the U.S. and the EU come to an agreement? Is, going to, is this going to be a stumbling agreement, or there's a room for compromise and one one final uh, comment uh, in the back here yeah hi thank you my name is Ben Hancock I'm a journalist with inside US trade I just wanted to ask a little bit about uh, what you all are doing right now uh, to raise TTIP on the radar of your colleagues I mean you mentioned that uh, obviously TPA comes first and uh, Congressman Keating you talked about the different the difficulty in trying to delineate TPP and TTIP. Well, TPA and, uh, and TPP are viewed together right now. How is that posing a challenge to you? How do you tell people that, you know, we're giving TPA for TTIP as well, not just TPP, maybe down the line at some point? I wonder if you guys could address so that. What about the question of public procurement and then like messaging with your own colleagues? So I personally am uncomfortable carving out any sectors of the economy uh, and then saying this will not be on the table for negotiation. So um, I, I do understand there are sensitive areas, national security, technologies, and hardware, uh, where uh, there may be some exceptions to that overall rule. But uh, I would even go further than is, uh, I would imagine, being contemplated. So uh, as the United States subsidize, subsidizes the research and development costs for uh, things like pharmaceuticals and medical devices uh, for Europe, uh, and, and Europe receives favorable pricing, uh, I'm in favor of pricing freedom. So uh, my preference would be to open up the healthcare sector as well. Uh, that uh, strikes me uh, as being advantageous to the Europeans as well as Americans. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 our European friends also need to know it, it's a challenge because our constitutional system is set up where the federal government cannot tell the states you know, the states have their own autonomy on many issues, right? And so that's our challenge here, but that should all be part of the discussion, uh, for yeah. sure. And our own uh, Department of Commerce, uh, for the last few years in particular, have been trying to open up to products uh, on the private side, uh, products that uh, had uh, exclusions because of defense reasons, uh, that no longer really have those uh, reasons or the rationale behind it. Perhaps this will be something that propels that movement forward so there can be more investment because we have things that products that are protected by that that are really out in the marketplace and have nothing to do with security anymore. Yeah. Go ahead. So yeah. on this matter of pricing freedom, I saw a little chatter amongst uh, some people out in the audience here because perhaps you hadn't considered it. And that was the reason I brought it up. I wanted to generate some conversation. But there are Medicaid programs. And that is our low income health insurance program across the country. These are managed uh, at the state level that are making very tough life and death decisions about the provision of expensive pharmaceuticals to our own citizens where Europeans have uh, price preferred access uh, to these very same drugs. These are serious but tough conversations that I think uh, people who share uh, a value in, in, in life and quality of life ought to be having. And I know you, the one other question yeah, just on right. the communication yeah. side is that, you know, again, sending a fact of the week out is something we're trying to engage our colleagues in, and I'm not sure what other communication we can do other than rely on other foundations, Brittleman Foundation and others have done a good job of right. explaining the economic growth that will happen in our own individual districts, you know, 3,000 jobs in my Minnesota district alone just from a TTIP, a successful TTIP agreement, and those are our communicating points. Well, I'd like to uh, thank uh, our panelists. Uh, this, I think, has been a very stimulating uh, and fruitful discussion. Actually, one of the more in-depth TTIP discussions I've conducted with members of Congress. So I really want to thank you, thank you for this. Thank you. And thank the audience for some great questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to also thank the German Marshall Fund, as the Congressman said, for, for uh, 
posting this. This is the first in what will be many discussions about TTIP, because unfortunately, the negotiation's not done yet, so we're gonna have a lot to talk about before it does get done. Questions get harder along yes, the way, I think. Exactly, yeah. thank you. Yeah.